Yes, well, good afternoon. Thanks for hanging around. My name is uh, Richard Newman, I said. I work for Wardle Armstrong Archaeology, so I've shown you a, a slide there of the pure commercial archaeologist's view of archaeology. Um, but as many of you might be able to tell from looking at me, I've been around for quite a long time, and Wardle Armstrong is only my latest incarnation. I have m many previous ones, including a uh, county archaeologist for Cumbria, and the reason for telling you that will become evident uh, shortly. Now, I might end up giving a bit of an old man's rant today. Uh, I've sat through a number of papers today in this session and in the session on uh, using drones, as we're now allowed to call them, UAVs, um, <clears throat> which also was quite relevant to the session here. But I should tell you, I'm not a surveyor. I can barely use a total station. Just about get away with a GPS. For goodness sake, I can't even use a, a sat-nav in the car. Strangely, I can read maps. Um, I can't use CAD. I can switch on a GIS and look at it, but I can't put anything into it. Luckily, for the past 25 years, I've usually had people who can. But I do think I understand landscapes. I do think I know how to interpret them. And I consider myself to be a landscape historian. I draw a distinction there. Um, and that's what my PhD was in back in the 1980s. And that will also be relevant to what I'm going to tell you about today. Now, there's some fabulous landscape surveys being undertaken, particularly in the county in which I'm based, Cumbria. The project I'm going to tell you about which is by way of a story, not by way of an analysis of that project. Uh, it's in Cumbria. I'm not going to show you where, because you either know where it is, or you've forgotten 30 seconds after I show you the map. So what's the point? It's not relevant to what I'm going to tell you. Cumbria, lovely county. A third of it's the Lake District. Two thirds of it aren't. Do not confuse it with the Lake District, like all the marketeers do. It really tees the rest of us off. It ain't the Lake District. In fact, about a quarter of it is shortly going to be Yorkshire Dales National Park. I mean, don't agree with that either. Um, <clears throat> but this is the sort of thing that English Heritage have been doing there. It's just taken off their website by means of a way of an illustration. Uh, sorry, Historic England. But Historic England have done some fabulous surveys. And I think one of the issues working in the commercial world is how can we cost-effectively aspire to the quality and level of the work that Historic England has done in a commercial milieu. Here's a commercial project, uh, recently, what's well, still underway in fact, uh, being und uh, undertaken in the borders. I use it by way of an illustration for extensive landscape survey, because that's the type of landscape survey I'm going to be talking about which really splits into two types. Ground truthing, which in my opinion is really nothing more than going out searching for nice photographs to the evidence that you've already compiled, and uh, rapid identification survey, with which we've heard plenty about uh, today. And one of the things we've been told about today is it's now gone beyond just putting dots on maps. Yes, it certainly has. And I think some of the Historic England surveys are very good examples of how it's gone beyond just putting dots on maps. And the story I'm going to tell you certainly is about more than just putting a dot on the map. Okay, the site, there in the middle. Not terribly exciting picture, but uh, just in case you can't tell, it's this area here. And up there. Or at least to start with it is. Why have we got interest? A um, couple of years ago, United Utilities uh, were tasked with getting water to West Cumbria. Now, even those of you who don't know much about the Lake District and Cumbria might wonder why West Cumbria requires water. You might think it's quite a wet place. This is true, but its water until recently came from uh, one of Cumbria's 
so-called lakes, Ennerdale, which is an enhanced lake and is partially a reservoir. And that supplied major towns like Whitehaven and Workington. Well, uh, the current thinking is that Ennerdale is an area that should be favoured for rewilding. Uh, there were also problems with some of the water coming from there. So they're going for artesian water now, which comes from the other side of Cumbria, and they've got to get it to the west coast. And that requires new pipelines. And this is where the environmental impact assessment bit comes into. I'm not going to go into details in environmental impact assessments. That sort of boring stuff is stuff I used to talk about, but yeah. I'm interested in bigger pictures nowadays. Uh, there are about seven options for routes. Um, and, and those options have changed consistently over the past two years. But one of the ones that hasn't is a route that goes smack through that site. Um, the routes were split up between three organisations. Oxford Archaeology did one set of routes. CFA from Edinburgh did another set. And Wardle Armstrong Archaeology did yet another set. And this is one of ours. We were tasked first to do a walkover. Now, this isn't in the sequence of you do a uh, desk-based assessment and then a site visit as part of that desk-based assessment. The desk-based assessment element and the walkover were quite distinct. The desk-based assessment was very high level and actually telling you roughly about the archaeology that you might expect to find in West Cumbria, which was pretty vague and pointless. Um, but that's what they wanted and that's what they got. So we then did a walkover and we sent people out to walk along these lines. Yes, we did have a look at Google Earth and somebody gone, oh, look, might be something here. Next thing, our people on site walked it, walked across it, went, yeah. Do you know how this was described? Humpy bumpy bits. And to be honest, when I was county archaeologist, that's often about the complete level of analysis that most commercial units gave me. The humpy bumpy bits. Well, at least I knew they were humpy bumpy bits, and we could go and have a look. And this might not have gone any further uh, with Ward Armstrong archaeology, to be fair. Except for, I had once been county archaeologist of Cumbria. And during... Um, I was a strange county archaeologist. I actually was interested in the archaeology and spent hours looking at the maps and what we had then had blue sky aerial photography, which now feeds into Google Earth. And one site that I consist consistently bugged me was this, on the first edition ordnance survey map called Tarnities. Why did it bug me? Well, it looks weird for a start. It's a big empty space. Oh, I'd like to find the point now. There it is. Come around here. That was strange. Name was strange. Was it a far, former dried out tarn? Well, no, because I looked on the ordnance survey mapping and clearly you couldn't have had a tarn there. It would have run off. It's a hill that goes all the way down to this stream. The nearest settlement, small nucleated settlement, actually just inside the Lake District, is there called Redmen. There's another one over here called Bridekirk. The clear field systems around uh, these settlements, you can spot them both by the uh, long, narrow, uh, slightly curvilinear boundaries of, of enclosed strips or, uh, that surround the settlements. Uh, you can also see them on aerial photographs. I don't know if you can make that out. There's also Ridge and Farrow in there quite a lot of it. There's a load of it up here, some in here, nicely defined area there. You might be able to vaguely see some here as well. And that made me wonder, what the hell is all the Ridge and Furrow doing out there? How come this isn't enclosed into strip fields and where's the settlement? So my initial thought was, there might be a, an old style thing in a DMV around there somewhere. Couldn't find any evidence for one. And anyway, I eventually had to get on with some work as county archaeologist and forgot about it. Um, but it came back to haunt me when we were doing uh, this survey. So as soon as we found 
the site that I showed you before down here and the humpy bit bumpy bits were noted I decided I can't go and find out what the hell's going on there so I went and visited it there's the site again um, but before visiting I had a look at Google Earth wonderful thing that Google Earth is and the first thing I noted was this egg-shaped enclosure here with ridge and furrow within it and probably another one here that's been ploughed out in this improved field on this side start to get more intriguing I also then started looking because there was another blank area amongst the ridge and furrow underneath the rock outcrop and when you look on Google Earth you can see some earthworks there that look like there may have been buildings and, a, and an enclosure. Okay, so visit the site. But when I was thinking of site, I was thinking of the entire landscape that I just showed you, the landscape of the Tarnties, not where the pipeline <coughs> was going through. But of course, when we did the survey, the walkover for United Utilities, we were told quite strictly a 100 metre corridor. And quite naturally the guys do a hundred meter corridor just the same as when they do an evaluation trench they do an evaluation trench the thing here is you've got to look up from that evaluation trench to put yourself in a context in an excavation you've got to look up and wider within the landscape to put your site in uh, context so we'll still just keep dealing with with the uh, physical evidence well the first thing that uh, occurred was this um, wall. Now, I'm not going to go into details, but believe you me, people who have looked into these things in Cumbria, we now reckon we can tell the difference between a medieval dry stone wall and a later dry stone wall. There are various things with the fact that medieval ones tend to go straight up, whereas more modern ones do that. Um, the nature of the dry stone walling, it doesn't follow any of the post-medieval regional uh, styles of dry stone walling and there's technical things to do with through stones etc which I won't go into but this is one of those walls that you ain't this looks like a medieval dry stone wall also by now I was starting to do a bit of documentary investigation and this turns out to be a township boundary it's the township the boundary between Redmay and the township to its north Talantyre so quite an interesting wall, but it's also the northern edge of that area called the Tarnities. And that's the nature of the wall going off into the distance, surrounding the northern end of the Tarnities. I showed you that site underneath the rock ledge. Um, and here we have the, the earthworks that are just, just about showing up on the surface you notice there's no scales in this the reason why there's no scales is that this field was full of cows at the far side they're, they're actually red cows i think they're a local breed and the farmer had warned us do not go in that field with those cows and the bull and the calves uh, and i was being scouted by two of the lead cows uh, who at this point had just hightailed it back to report back to the bull that I was in their field. So I wasn't going to hang around putting a scale down, taking detailed photographs. These were incredibly quick snaps whilst I was sweating profusely and beginning to panic. Even the sheep looked a bit aggressive. And there's uh, some more of the earthworks. That you see. So it was clearly a site there. So we've now got this area of lots of ridge and furrow enclosed by what appears to be a medieval dry stone wall with at least two sites within it that the ridge and furrow observes lovely uh, broad broad rig um, nice view the site where the pipeline's going in is just down in front of these trees here and to just for locating you i think that's into the valley of lowes water uh, that's the lake district mountains in the background so there we go we're beginning to put together a story from uh, the field evidence but the documents give us a better one because 
In the county history from the 1780s, there's reference to an area called the Trinities, which is actually a better term than the Tarnities. And the Trinities are, uh, were reckoned to be the home estate granted to the monks of Gisborough when they were given the manor of Redmay. That leads us to looking at the uh, cartulary for Gisborough Priory, and they indeed were granted the whole of the manor of Redmay. So they were the manorial lords of Redmay. Also, uh, my wife had been doing her PhD research and had come across a reference uh, whilst looking at the Granges of Cumbria uh, to uh, St. Bee's Priory and them holding a house in Tallentire that was adjacent to the house of the monks of Gisborough. Well, the Tallentire holding is where I'm standing taking the photograph, adjacent to it, the holding of the monks of Gisborough. So we're beginning to see that what we're likely to have here is, in the broad sense of the term Grange, Grange being simply a word that means a farm that isn't in at your home holdings. Gisborough's over in Middlesbrough, so I think we can say it isn't at its home holdings. So back to the site. We went and visited the site. We met the farmer on site. Uh, Got some useful information out from him. Apparently this had been metal detected on a number of occasions. Uh, he thought they were Roman coins, but they were silver with um, crosses on the back of them, and they'd been clipped. So he said, mm, probably medieval. Um, so that was some interesting information to, to add into it. As a result of all this, we were able to say to United Utilities, you know, when we have some evaluation trenching, we really need to put some there. And we explained why. We thought that it was part of this Grange holding uh, of Gisborough Priory. And this is some of the stuff that we came up with. Uh, revetment in this trench here. A nice wall in this trench here. Uh, also, I don't have a picture of it. But a silver long cross penny of Edward I. That was clipped. Um, so, in all... We did pay the, the desk-based assessment and uh, the work we'd done had actually worked out. So the final interpretation. Taking into account what Andrew had said, very good point. What was it? Data should be the starting point, not the end result. Absolutely. You know, I used to get fed up with county archaeologists as just having data given back to me. Often the bloody data I'd given them in the first place. <laughs> not put in any context. Oh, look, here we are, 200 metres away, is an Iron Age site. Oh, great. What the hell's that got to do with the site that I'm actually looking at? I'm more interested in the fact that three kilometres away, there's a, an Iron Age site in a similar environmental location. Anyway, enough of my little rant. This is the interpretation. My wife has been doing a characterisation for a PhD, which she's now got, of, um, of Cumbria, the medieval landscape of Cumbria. And we dropped this information in, actually only a couple of days ago, into that characterisation to see how it fits. Here is Redmen. There, even on the modern Ordnance Survey map, is a farm called Grange Farm. You shouldn't really get too excited about finding a name called Grange Farm. Doesn't mean to say it's got any monastic uh, relationships. It doesn't even mean to say it's got any historical significance. But in this case, it probably does, uh, because right next to the existing Grange Farm is an empty croft, in that croft are some nice earthworks. Uh, and I suspect that is going to be, if you like, the manorial site, the monks' manorial site, because they hold the whole of the township of Redmain, which is neatly marked out here for you, all the way around there. The wall I was showing you goes all the way along here. Probably goes down here as well, but I haven't walked that far to find out. Uh, the field system that relates to Red Main, the common fields are around here, they're in this colour. This is a piece of characterisation, obviously, you'll be familiar with it. This area here was uh, certainly open waste right up to the late 18th century. We suspect possibly that this area, high trees, wood, uh, high, more wood, 
and this is known as Highmore, and you look at the straight boundaries there, although it's not enclosed by Act of Parliament, it, it looks like it's quite late enclosure, and this area too, this might have all been open waste grazing land. Except for the fact, if you remember back to the original aerial photograph, there is actually ridge and furrow in there. I don't understand that. I'm, I'm not really sure what that's doing. Um, we think that the Grange Farm, which may eventually, may have possibly included these two ovals, um, but that this was the main bit of arable Grange Farm. Two sites that I showed you. Uh, this appears to be where the monks were defrauding the crown by Nick in Silver. Um, we don't fully understand these sites yet, and archaeological work will be necessary. But we've gone a long way to telling the story. We're way beyond some humpy bumpy bits in the field. Fortunately, this doesn't happen all the time, and why doesn't happen all the time? One the way to sort this out was local knowledge. You're not necessarily going to have that local knowledge if you go into an area that you're not particularly familiar with. Fair enough, if you don't have it in-house, at least go and ask somebody. Ask the local society. Talk to the landowner. It's amazing what they can tell you. It also required you to have a certain amount of historical and geographical knowledge. And this is where I am going to write. Because I've trained numerous archaeologists over the years in various reasons. It's a bloody problem when people come out of university with their archaeology degree, but they've never done any geography or history in school. And that ain't their fault. That's our education system. But that's another story. But there's a real problem there. If people are geographically and historically illiterate, history consists of the Tudors, the Victorians, and the First World War, how the heck are they going to understand about medieval granges? I don't know the answer to that. Well, some of it relies on your vote, but I don't think any of the politicians are clever enough to work out that. Um, so there's, there is an issue there. But there are certain things we can do. Use easily available sources. I mean, all the resources we've been talking about, all the things that we can do, photograms, you all, wonderful stuff, fantastic technological stuff, that there are people out there that I can employ who can do it, because I can't, but it's wonderful and I will use it. But there's easily available sources. LIDARs even now, without manipulating it, but just as the basic LIDAR tiles, it's out there, it's available, you can look at it. Historic maps, so much is now online. But it's not that difficult to go to a record office, although it can often be difficult to access the record offices now, and that they're often only open two days a week. Look at historic landscape descriptions in county histories, etc. Use the historic landscape characterizations. You might not agree with characterization approaches, but you've got something to bounce off. This is all easy stuff. This takes a couple of hours at most. But perhaps even more important is ask questions. Where's the water supply? What is the nature of the enclosure? How does your site relate to nearby historic settlements? Simple, basic questions. Exactly the same as a site director you've always told people on site. Look above the trench. Put it in context. Put your site in context. Because if you don't, what, and this is a very simple, and I'm sure most of you know this, and I'm teaching grannies to suck eggs, but if we don't do that, the level of information that we're getting back, and more importantly, how we're viewing the significance of the site, is just inaccurate. We're not doing the job. And that's the key thing with this, is we were able to turn around to you and go, this is your most significant site that you've got on the entire line. And I would now hope that the current county archaeologists would be telling them to try and avoid it. There is an issue with it. There's an issue to do with how water flows. It needs gravity, and this does look like a pinch point, and they might have to go through it, in which case they could throw the kitchen sink out of it, at it to research it. So... That's the end of my story, and that's the end of my rant, and there you have a veteran archaeologist next to a veteran tree. <laughs> Thanks very much.